Hello, I'm Brad Littlejohn, and in this video, I'd like to read an excerpt from the most recent Davenant Trust publication, which is part of uh, an ongoing project to modernize Richard Hooker's laws. We've called this book Radicalism When Reform Becomes Revolution. And the passage I'm going to read is a, a famous bit where Hooker is describing the history of the Anabaptist movement, which he thinks the radical Puritans in England are in danger of following the same road. In reply to all my objections, you say that we should seek those things in accordance with God's will, not those things which are most convenient for ourselves. Therefore, since your Presbyterian discipline is, as you erroneously claim, the absolute commandment of God, it must be established though the world be turned upside down. Here lies the greatest danger of all. For when divine authority is used to justify things which are not the commandments of God, but your own mistaken suppositions, you will attribute to God whatever you are later led to do in defense of your cause. And what this may lead to, God only knows. In these sorts of errors, once the mind imagines itself to be executing God's will, it immediately removes anything or anyone that stands in its way. And if anything strange or new seems to be necessary, its lawfulness is introduced and approved under the name of divine authority. One example will be enough to show that false opinions about the will of God often bring about violent resistance to all who would oppose and create new opinions worse than the first, sometimes ending with the complete opposite of what was originally intended. And then skipping forward a couple pages. As far as reform of political authority was concerned, these Anabaptists professed the desire that Christ should have dominion over all, and that crowns and scepters should be thrown at his feet, no one but he reigning over Christian men, no government keeping them in awe but Christ's discipline, and no sword carried except the sword of spiritual excommunication. Thus they labored with all their might to overturn the seats of the magistracy, because Christ said the kings of the Gentiles have lordship. They labored to abolish the execution of justice, because Christ said, Resist not him that is evil. They labored to forbid oaths so necessary for trials, because Christ said, Swear not at all. Finally, they labored to have all things in common, because Christ, by his apostles, had given the world such an example, so that men would excel one another, not in wealth, the pillar of all political authority, but in virtue. These men at first were only pitied in their error, and few stood in their way. Their apparently great humility, zeal, and devotion was a sign to most men that they meant no harm, and the worst thing men of sound understanding said against them was, Oh, with what good intentions these poor souls do evil. Through this merciful toleration, they became stronger than was safe for the commonwealth in which they lived. They had their secret corner meetings and assemblies in the night, and men flocked to them by thousands. The way they attracted and retained such multitudes was particularly effective. First, they appeared to be caught up in such a wonderful zeal for God that it showed in every word they spoke. Second, they gained a reputation for hating sin and loving integrity more than all others, because they so often filled the ears of the people with attacks on their lawful guides, both spiritual and civil. Third, they showed great generosity and eased the plight of the needy, such people as would be readiest to follow them. Fourth, their tender compassion made them shower tears for the miseries of the common people, bewailing how nobody paid enough attention to them. Their goods were being devoured by vultures, who held them in contempt and took both their spiritual and temporal liberties, and it was high time that God hear their cries and send deliverance. Finally, through a clever sleight of hand, they would stroke their followers' egos by applying to them all the favorable titles, good words, and promises in Scripture, as well as applying the opposite to those of any other party. In response to these deceivers, the people answered with one accord, Truly, these are men of God, these his true and sincere prophets. If any prophet or man of God suffered a lawfully deserved punishment, whether for felony, rebellion, murder, or whatever else, the people, so strangely were their hearts enchanted, lamented that God had taken away one of his dearest servants. They would have been no less passionate if Stephen himself had been martyred a second time. In all these things, they were fully persuaded that what they did was in obedience to the will of God, and that all men should do as they did. All that was left was to put their ideas into action, that the whole world might, if possible, be reconstructed accordingly. They soon realized that there would be great opposition and resistance, and they entered into a secret league together to strengthen themselves. They also realized that wars might wear out even their strong numbers, and considered that to speedily strengthen their numbers, God might want them to do just as God's chosen people Israel did. This idea pleased them very much and their desire was apt to breed confidence in the possibility and a willingness to argue for it from Scripture. 
Nothing seemed more obvious than that they were the new Jerusalem spoken of in Scripture, and that the Old Testament was a picture of what they should be and do. Here they applied to themselves all the passages about God's favor and gifts granted to the commonwealth of Israel, concluding that just as Israel had been delivered out of Egypt, so they too would be delivered from the Egypt of this world's bondage to sin and superstition. Just as Israel was to root out the idolatrous nations from the land and plant in it a people that feared God, so too it was the Lord's good will and pleasure for a new Israel, under new Joshua's, Samson's, and Gideon's, to perform an even greater miracle, to violently cast out the wicked from the earth and to establish the kingdom of Christ with perfect liberty. They also concluded that just as the children of Israel took many wives so that the casualties of war might not hinder God's promise that they would become a great multitude, so it seemed not unlikely that for the growth of Christ's kingdom and the gospel, the Lord might allow the same today. Whenever they gathered something new like this out of Scripture, they would insist that it was the Father's appointment, His commandment, His will and charge, this is exactly the point for which I write. My purpose is to show that when the minds of men are once erroneously persuaded that it is the will of God for them to do those things they fancy, their opinions are as thorns in their sides, not allowing them to rest until they have put their speculations into practice. Their restless desire to remove anything in their way leads them by the hand into increasingly dangerous opinions, sometimes quite contrary to their original ideas. Whenever people hide their own errors under the cloak of divine authority, it is impossible for anyone to imagine what will come of it until time has revealed the fruits. Therefore, it is only wisdom to fear what may come of it, even beyond any apparent cause for fear.